So we're going to begin. <laughs> we're going to begin with the coronavirus. U.S. has now surpassed 11 million coronavirus cases as hospitals are pushed to the breaking point. It took just one week for the U.S. to go from 10 million to 11 million confirmed cases. Consider that that is more cases in seven days here in the United States than all but nine countries have seen in total worldwide. Hospitalizations are also at the highest number since the crisis began, and 48 states have reported an increase in average daily hospitalizations over the past week. Today, at least four states are implementing new coronavirus restrictions. The city of Chicago is also imposing a stay-at-home advisory. But just this morning, we learned some very encouraging news. Moderna says preliminary results show its Phase 3 vaccine is 94.5% effective in trials. Last time I checked, 94 is a really good score. This comes after Pfizer said last week that its vaccine was more than 90% effective. Joining us now is a member of the president-elect Joe Biden's new coronavirus advisory board, Michael Osterholm. He's an epidemiologist and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. First on CBS this morning, he's announcing a new fund to help families of frontline health care workers who have lost their lives to COVID-19. Mr. Osama, I'll get to that in just a second. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. But I, I, I want to start. You. You, you've said that this is the most dangerous time uh, since 1918, the pandemic of 1918. Um, where is this trend line taking us and what do we have to do immediately to get this under control? Well, uh, first of all, the great news is what we heard today from Moderna and the fact that we have a vaccine that not only prevented illnesses, but evidence of severe illnesses. So we have to imagine that we're going to a day and hopefully in the months ahead where this will be behind us. But right now we are in the most dangerous period, as you noted. Uh, you know what the numbers are right now and what we call exponential growth, where the case numbers are literally doubling every few days. And uh, I think between now and well and past the holidays, uh, we are going to see a major increase in, in cases in this country and many parts of the world. You've spoken to a handful of governors. What have you recommended they do? I think all governors right now are just looking for what to do. They want to base it on science. They have to. They understand the economy. We are really at a disadvantage because if we're going to ask people to suffer for this from an economic standpoint, meaning shutting down their businesses, people being unemployed, uh, city governments, state governments no longer able to fund many of the very essential workers, fire, police, we need economic support to take care of that if we're going to also take care of the pandemic. And so until we get that, it's going to be a real challenge for governors to do anything that doesn't uh, cause great conflict within their communities. Should there be a uniform national response, do you believe? And if so, what should that look like? Well, clearly, each and every area of the country has a little bit different picture on what's happening, meaning, in some cases, uh, the transmission is more in c the communities of color. In other areas in rural uh, America, it's not. But what we need to do is have a standard set of principles. What are we trying to do? We're trying to get ourselves through this period to a time when vaccine will end this pandemic as we know it. And right now, we don't have a standardized set. So what you're hearing is all these governors and mayors are scrambling to try to find what is the right answer for us. And it would surely help all of them, and that's what I'm hearing from them, if we had a standardized set of, of recommendations and protocols. As we mentioned, you're launching a, a new fund with the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation to support families of health care workers uh, who, who died of COVID-19. Tell us about what you're doing. Well, you know, we have witnessed over the course of this pandemic the most horrible, tragic pain of watching healthcare workers themselves become patients and dying. Over 1,400 healthcare workers in this country have died from COVID-19. Not all of them, of course, from work, but many. And it has disproportionately affected our communities of color. And, you know, they've been there for us. They've been there to take care of us. Uh, we can't make it right what's happened, but we can do something about that. So this fund is to help the families. It's to help the children. We're going to be offering college scholarships to all the children of these fallen heroes. And so what we are hoping today is that America understands the uh, major sacrifice these families have made. We'll all get to behind us here and support these families in a way that uh, uh, it's the least we can do for what they've done for us. It sure is, and they continue to, to uh, sacrifice for us. Michael Osterholm, thank you so much for more information on the fund to help families of healthcare workers. Visit frontlinefamiliesfund.org.